the core message of your book, uh, The Price of Tomorrow, is about whether or not we keep on playing the inflation game, which you suggest is baked into our economic system uh, as a prerequisite, essentially. I mean, you know, you hear the Federal Reserve and Central Bank say all the time, we have an inflation target. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's uh, not too high, but also not zero. It's got to be a positive number. Inflation is exactly the same thing as wage deflation. It's the opposite side of the coin. So in other words, to try to create more jobs, you're paying people less in real terms. And you can see the political divide. You can see the haves and the haves nots getting worse and worse and worse caused by the same thing with different actors on both sides of the system saying, I'll fix it without re realizing the root cause of the problem. We, we believe we need inflation. It is my pleasure to welcome to Yang Speaks, technology entrepreneur extraordinaire, chairman of eight companies, and the author of The Price of Tomorrow, one of the, I think he was formerly one of the top CEOs to follow on Twitter, Mr. Jeff Booth. <laughs> Thanks, Andrew. Pleasure to be here. <laughs> it's great to meet you, and congratulations on a really, really thoughtful and incisive book. Uh, I learned a lot from it. Um, so first, let's fill the listeners in on who the heck you are, uh, what the heck you've done, <laughs> the sense from reading your book that you spent years on a, a platform company, uh, Build Direct, that was helping contractors. And it seems like this this job, this company was a labor of love uh, for a, a number of years. But how the heck did you wind up in that position? And um, how does one even start to become a technology entrepreneur? <laughs> <laughs> that is interesting. Well, I'd say what any entrepreneur does is they take a look at an existing system that they think doesn't provide value to somebody else. Um, and they think they can create a new business by providing value. So, so to, that's really what I did. I was actually a builder before uh, before that technology company. Wait, I really, press. you were a literal builder. I was a literal bu builder, so always an entrepreneur. But I was a, I, I had a building company. I, I owned a real estate company, and and what I realized in the building company, I actually failed to deliver a house on time to people, and I put a, I had to put their furniture and storage them up in a hotel, and I was really I was really uh, mad. Um, that I was frustrated that I couldn't do the job I said I could do because the system was so broken. So I set out to change that, and I set out to change that with technology, and that became, it, it, like you say, a labor of love, creating a platform technolo technology company, similar to Amazon.com throughout the dot-com crisis and everything else in, in a certain industry. Um, and from the Amazon that, of building, <laughs> that's what I set out to do. It didn't, it didn't end up there in the end, but I, but, uh, but you, you can imagine how much you learn, learn along the way, but that is what I set out to do. So you have a faint Canadian accent, uh, and that's, <laughs> it, that's where you hail from. Uh, are you there now? I am. I'm here now just outside of Vancouver. Oh, good for you. Beautiful part of the world. If, if anyone hasn't been. Um, so you built Build Direct uh, for a number of years, and then it had its trials and tribulations. How many years ago was that? Uh, Twenty years ago now. Uh, so it started, yeah, uh, st uh, started in well, just over uh, 1999. Wow! And what the heck has happened since then? I've learned a lot about myself technology, where the world's going, um, what what it means. Uh, and, and and one of the things that it, it kind of into the book, my that first technology company, it took $5 million of labor or technology, people building technology for something that is today available for $50 a month. And that, uh, and so it took about two years of building that first technolo technology for today, $50 a month. And today's version is way better than what, what we built at that time. So how fast technology is moving, people just don't realize what that looks like. And our brains don't change that fast. So, so, uh, so it, it, that just gave me, at, at, at a high level, um, 
a whole bunch of structural change that was happening um, and, and at different levels. And you could create a lot of value. I do create a lot of value even today out of, out of different technology companies. But really, think about what they do, what you do as an entrepreneur. It, um, you only win if you're, if, you're, if you're valuable to other people. That's how, uh, and, and, and today, the technology that allows you to be more valuable to other people allows you to win in an ever-increasing rate. And so that, that, that structure, which is deflationary in nature, so it reduces prices and it reduces prices more and more as people vote to use services, is hitting up a structure that we've always lived in which is an inflationary structure where, where we essentially try to make prices go up through our lives. And so, so those two things are incompatible together. And I, and, and I know you do a lot of work on what the solution is. I, I, I have a different version of a solution, um, but, uh, but, but, but I think we see the world similar in, in where things are going. Yeah, we do. This is how we got connected is that we're like book buddies um, because people recommended your book to me and it is an excellent book, The Price of Tomorrow. Uh, and we make similar arguments. Um, we wind up in slightly different places, um, but your argument was a bit different than mine. And I want to unpack what you just said, because I think it's in many ways the core message of your book, uh, The Price of Tomorrow, is about whether or not we keep on playing the inflation game, which you suggest is baked into our economic system uh, as a prerequisite, essentially. I mean, you know, you hear the Federal Reserve and Central Bank say all the time, we have an inflation target. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's uh, not too high, but also not zero. It's got to be a positive number. Um, and one of the central arguments you make is that, hey, technology is intrinsically deflationary where we're getting to do things faster, uh, cheaper, more efficiently, uh, it's going to churn up a lot of jobs because a lot of people's jobs are born of various inefficiencies and excess expenses. And so as technology gets better and better, you're going to see prices naturally want to go down in a lot of areas. And, and Andrew, one of the things I was really looking forward to coming on your show uh, to, to do, um, I think you're really thoughtful in this. Um, and, and, and in this type of structural change, it requires really bright people to think. And, and instead of believing we live in a framework that we used to live in and papering over an existing framework, I think it requires critical thought to how do we transition into a world that looks very different. Because, because if you just follow the track of technology, most of the deflation, it, it's actually just, uh, if you look at your phone, it's it, everything on your phone is free. Um, and we celebrate that. Every one of us votes for getting more for less out of a, our individual time. It's actually why we use technology in a business. We try to, to make our time more valuable. It's why we use technology personally. We try to make our time uh, more valuable. And we all vote for that every day. And, and today, it's moving at an extraordinary pace, way faster than people know, um, with uh, an exponential pace. And with, with AI, robotics, everything else, it's going to accelerate to where people just can't even relate. Um, and so if you follow that path where we're all voting to get more for less, how can the system be designed to work exactly the opposite? Um, where where we, we all vote with our individual time to increase our time, but we vote collectively to say somebody should control making prices go up for in perpetuity forever. Well, and, the, and, the and, argument I made on the presidential trail was this, Jeff, and this is familiar to you, and you make a similar uh, comment in your book, which is that you have a lot of things that are getting cheaper or more available, more plentiful. And then there are a few really big ticket items where prices just go up and up. And unfortunately, those things are making everyone miserable. Those three are housing, education, and healthcare, the big three, where they're just getting more and more expensive, even as technology advances. And in America, it's making everyone very sad because their buying power is staying more or less the same. And then their housing, <laughs> their education, healthcare costs keep going up and they're like, ah, like, what is going on? Why am I so miserable? And then you have in categories like media, clothing, um, 
cars to some extent, um, and most entertainment um, uh, forms, the prices are staying the same or even going down or the quality is going up. I think cars are staying about the same price, but the quality has gone up a whole lot. Um, so, there, so there are elements uh, where you can see things getting better and you're getting more bang for your buck. But then the big three uh, occupy most of your mind, uh, okay, you know, let, mind space. So, so let's unpack that a little bit more because I think it's really critical to this, this discussion. And first, before we unpack it, let's just imagine this. Everything we measure is from an existing system. We don't measure what a new system could look like. We measure an existing system. And it's actually where why businesses get trapped in an existing system too. Blockbuster measures how many people come into their stores and they don't measure how fast Netflix is moving. And then a change in technology changes the game and all the stores become irrelevant. And instead of thinking about what how fast technology is moving, what they do is, is add candy aisles to their stores, thinking that they'll cha change things. The same thing we do. Right. So I, I use that example because it's important that we, we look at blockbuster execs and think, how could they miss technology moving so fast? Yet we do it in our lives every day. It's what we do. So we we're in a system measuring things, GDP to always go up. And that system is being manipulated through inflation by printing money to make prices always go up. And so we don't, we don't ask the question. So, so. Today, there's 250 trillion, actually, there's more today. When I wrote the book, $250 trillion of global debt to run an $80 trillion global economy. And you would think, could that debt ever be paid back? Probably not. Those are huge numbers. But maybe, maybe we find some other industries that we could grow faster. But when you examine it deeper, what you realize is $185 trillion of that $250 trillion of debt came in the last 20 years. And then we fail to recognize that would our houses actually have gone up in value if you didn't stimulate them by $185 trillion globally over the last 20 years? And the answer is simply no. Neither would education, neither would anything else. So now you run into, now you start to see the problem. And you start to see if somebody controls money and they can constantly control money, then some people win out of that economic equation and some people lose, and you you destroy the free market by doing so. So, well, well, so this this is one of the big arguments you make, which uh, the math you know is very compelling. Where you say, look, what we've been doing is we've been juicing growth by printing a lot of money, but it's by pumping up debt. And the numbers you just cited are saying that we're not actually getting that much growth <laughs> for all the exactly. for, for all the debt we're taking out. It's going into stores of value. It's going into what would you do? What would a rational actor do if people, if you're printing that much money? And what would happen? A rational actor would put more money into real estate to try to try to to try to get away from that printing. Rational actors would. I need to get into the best schools, and I'm I have more money than those other people, so I need to get into those because it's my only way to get out of the system and try. And so what you're doing is you're pushing prices up. Rent prices are going up. More and more people are left out. And, and those people are coming back to the same government, whether no matter what side of the aisle you're on, the same government saying, we need you to fix this problem. But the problem is a structural problem. And it's not bad people in, on either side. It's they're both dealing from a structural issue that can't be solved by the same structure. System change can't come from the system that created the problem. I found this argument really fascinating, um, and most of it's incontrovertible. Like you know, we have printed a lot of money. <laughs> no, no I, I will say that um, uh, my sense of why prices have gone up um, in education and healthcare—it's not just that we produced a lot of currency; it's that the institutions uh, aren't actually driven to become more efficient, um, where they're 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 being driven to just make more money. And in both of those industries, if you're a hospital and you decide to ratchet the prices up, then it just gets passed along to consumers who feel like they don't have a choice but to pay because it's not like you have an alternative healthcare system to go to. Uh, and the same is true for college tuition, where every year the colleges look up and say, how much are we going to increase the prices by this year? Like, you know, And and, uh, and so that has 
um, added up over time. Um, and, and so when I was making this argument to folks on the trail, it was like, look, these institutions just aren't really price. Uh, uh, they're not negotiating on price because they think that you as the consumer don't have a choice. So you're not price sensitive. Let me jump into that one specifically because I think it'll 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 change it might change a whole bunch of people's minds on this thing. Now remember, our minds once we believe in something are hard to change. They're really so we'll kind of keep on reinforcing uh, re- reinforcing our beliefs instead of objectively looking at the facts. But here's a fact: education is already free. It's already free. It's um, it's it's certification is not. And why we, we stay in that system is we believe we'll get a better job, higher paying job by, by staying in that system. But, but I, and I, I've hired thousands of people and I can tell you um, the curious driven person that is always learning, that is finding their way to le- uh, uh, learn, I would hire almost a hundred times out of a hundred over somebody that just thinks I got an education, now I'm done. And, and so, so if you, with an internet connection, you could learn, you could get to any PhD uh, professor, you could learn anything on so any. It's topic. not just certification though, Jeff, because check it out. Like, I agree with you that, look, I can access the, the content, the, the learning. Yeah. Um, but, and you have kids, right? I have three kids. Yeah. yeah. Are they college age? They're ones just getting into college. Yeah. Yeah. So if, if you look at the average 18 year old as to why they're going to college, here's, here's the. Um, the sense I have. Most of them could not tell you about all of the different courses uh, that they uh, plan on taking or the professors. They pick a school, one, because of the credentialing you speak of, uh, because everyone will just say, hey, UVA, great school. Um, But there's also the socialization that takes place. um, And then there's the network that takes place because they'll be friends with all these other UVA grads. Uh, And then education in terms of like the book learning and whatnot is somewhere in there um, uh, along with like a whole suite of other value adds. Um, So, so the content, anyone can, you know, probably just go out and buy a textbook, you know, and then, and the rest of it, but, uh, but it's not just credentialing. It's like this whole suite of other things. I totally agree with you and my daughter. It's not just that too. I want to go have fun. Right. I want to meet a whole yeah, bunch it's of like some of it's partnering. Some right. of it's like yeah. I want, you know, like yeah. people, some people will go to business school because they, you know, they're looking to find a, a partner. I guess what I'm getting at is a monopoly believes it has power forever and doesn't have to change while technology is moving the other way. And technology has changed the rules of what that looks like. And and today, some people are just waking up to that change. And I would I would say over time as school prices get higher and higher and higher and more and more value accretes to, to people who can learn on their own, we will see we, our beliefs will change around, uh, around school. And ever, as they change around school, they, um, that takes a whole nother industry out of <laughs> rising prices. Now we could argue well, that for Jeff, but here's where it gets interesting. Like I have friends, you probably have some of the same friends, who have been trying to innovate in education for quite some time saying, you know what, like I can provide the same thing for, you know, ha- have the price. Um, Minerva comes to mind. Um, Khan Academy Yamale is working on another one. Sorry. Khan Academy. Oh Khan, yeah. Khan Academy is like the very high level um, free-ish one that, that helps uh, people learn all over the world. Um, and the, these things have not disrupted college in the way that anyone had imagined in part because, and again, if you look at your own experience, if, you know, if I, I have two boys, they're not college age yet, um, but I kind of expect them to go to college. <laughs> Wait, but, but it's funny that you say that. And I, by the way, that we could go down this rabbit hole forever because this is a belief change. And, and I think you're right right now, but I, I, but I would say over time, those beliefs change and they change because the market creates a creates a different well, way of well, what, what happens is you have a handful of really mavericky young people whom i love who look up and say hey i don't need like all the fancy buildings and the rest of it like i, I, I was wanted, one i was one <laughs> uh, yeah that could have been you yeah. um and, and then you'll have some people who are locked out of um the traditional system or 
uh, you know, think it's a terrible value. Uh, but for a lot of families, if they have the ability to, to go, um, they'll try and send their kids to college because, uh, you know, it's what they did or it's what all of the kids around their kids are doing or, you know, uh, you know, or uh, a lot of it will be for um, the social aspect. Um, and so anyway, I don't want to take us too far uh, down a digression here. Um, but you but and I fundamentally I agree with, yeah. with uh, you know, on, on a lot of these things. Um, and I also would agree with you on uh, the fact that a lot of asset values, uh, real estate would be maybe the most prominent. Um, but I would say uh, stock prices yeah. would be another. <laughs> like yeah. that, that yeah. there, are, there are various assets um, that are being inflated in price, um, in part because we just have so much money in the system. Well, when you have when you have BlackRock, essentially an agent of the government, buying uh, uh, buying houses against population, you can see pushing prices up. So they're competing in the open housing market for for houses. You can see what's happening. So that concentration of wealth, the more assets you have, and the more printing you do, those prices just go up. And 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 then what ends up happening out of that system. So if if you think about that system, that system is is so we don't see it because we measure the system. Our daily lives are measuring the system. But food prices go up, asset prices go up, everything else, all the food and a whole bunch of people. Inflation is exactly the same thing as wage deflation. It's the opposite side of the coin. So in other words, to try to create more jobs, you're paying people less in real terms. And, and, and their income and their savings are going down in real, ter- in real terms. And, you won- and we wonder why we have conflict, gl- growing cl- conflict all over the world. It's caused by that exact same thing. But, but then people come up to, and, and, and you can see the political divide. You can see the haves and the haves nots getting worse and worse and worse caused by the same thing with different actors on both sides of the system saying, I'll fix it without re- realizing the root cause of the problem. So we agree on that fundamental dynamic, which is really, really deep. Uh, where What you're saying is, look, you control the money supply, you produce more money, who wins? Uh, people with assets, people who, who can take advantage of price appreciation, who loses? People who are just trading their labor for money, because that money just gets worth less and less over time because they can't buy as much with it. We completely agree there. Yeah. And, and then you believe, and I agree that this is going to drive political unrest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is, look, look at signposts. They're everywhere. <laughs> yeah. And, and this was the argument I made running for president. I said, look, Trump is a symptom, not the disease. Uh, he's a symptom of an economy that has left millions of people behind and they're just getting more and more ticked off. Um, and uh, it's worse in some of the traditional swing states that Democrats used to win and now are losing, like uh, Ohio and Iowa, uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, we, you know, uh, I think um, was a toss up, and I think narrowly went blue. Um, so there, so the the effects of um, wage deflation, as you call it. And then I, I was making an automation argument, um, but that there are forces that are pushing in the same direction are going to end up driving our politics in various ways. Keep going, uh, keep going though, because I totally agree. And so now we are on a, w- one thing people think about is AI, one day we'll have it, one day, one day we won't have it, one day we'll have it. And it doesn't work like that. It's on a, it's a, on a trend. And that trend that you're talking about or robotics, that trend on robotics, or 3D printing, or 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 all of these things, or energy, that trend um, is further and further. It means most of the deflation is in front of us. And so if it took $185 trillion of stimulus to stop it, then, then it, it requires exponentially more over and over and over um, to be able to... T- so, so what we're seeing now is just the tip of the iceberg of what we will see on this path. Yes. I will say your book made me want to run out and uh, try and hedge against inflation in any way you can. Um, I just got off the phone uh, 
with a friend who had just launched an ETF uh, called INFL, which is a hedge against inflation. And he says, hey, we're doing great. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, so, and and, and one, one, thing, the, one thing I think inside the argument, because it is, a deep, it, it is a deep thesis, and again, we're measuring a system. So a lot of times we won't even look at this because we don't want it to be true, but it is true. Now, inside, inside that, there's a, there's a couple of layers to that. We think about inflation measuring off zero. What if the disinflationary um, uh, power of technology 20 years ago was negative 1%? That's what the economy is, is your time freed up and you got th- more and more for less and less. And then what if today it's negative 5% because technology is moving faster and faster on a trend? So then 2 or 3 or 5% inflation would look like a way bigger theft it would look like because all inflation is is it's it is a theft it's i'm going to steal your money and give it to somebody else it's robin hood in reverse um and and i wish that wasn't true but it is um and and so what if um what if our actual system underneath is actually getting more and more disinflationary and more inflationary and so but we are not measuring it we're measuring it off zero then what would look like inflation of two percent would be a, a greater conflict to the world i hear what you're saying that the base rate maybe you look at it as like minus two percent so then this two percent inflation is like really four compounding so one one of the observations you make, which was interesting, uh, we said, look, you have a limited number of options if you are in the situation you are in and you are a government. Uh, number one is austerity. <laughs> you, you, you stop um, spending money. Uh, number two is you print more money. Uh, and then uh, and then if you are a government, um, Austerity is very unappealing. <laughs> so your logical thing to do is, is number two. Uh, number three is redistribution, um, which some people listening to this will be very excited by. Um, and I, as you know, like I'm for universal basic income. I think there are ways to do it where it, it's not terribly punitive. Uh, and I think that the money that goes into the hands of people at the bottom would end up um, doing a lot of good, like in very good places. And then there was a, a fourth option, um, which is, uh, what was the fourth option? It, it, it typically comes through revolution and war. Oh, uh, yes. The one yeah. I forgot. Revolution yeah. and war. So, so, you said that wow. that was, so, so you can see why uh, a government chooses to print if those are the options. Um, and I think the subtext of your book was that eventually you wind up with a revolution or uh, at least that was a suggestion I got. Yeah, and 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 this is why I wrote the book. Is is uh, I want for anything that doesn't happen. I want a most peaceful, uh, peaceful reset. I, I want a system that will work into the future in perpetuity. And and so let's look at that. And and so so and let's. Why don't we examine UBI from from uh, actually before we do that? Let's let's start with climate change. Right, so there's a there's a bunch of people which with a cognitive dissonance that that says so technology is is driving prices cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, and a lot of that technology is green. We get more for less. It lets you solar energy as as it, so it's wanting to make energy prices cheaper, and everything we have is on top of those energy prices, and so you have more, and it's getting cheaper by about eleven percent per year as it moves into more parts of the industry. So what you could expect, what you could deduct from that is everything is going to get cheaper. But if you live in an inflationary environment where everything has to get ex- more expensive or the entire system collapses, then you have to keep printing money. So you keep us human beings as rats on wheels running faster and faster, needing two jobs, driving back and forth to, for two jobs to work faster and faster and faster at an ever increasing velocity to try to, to stop that deflationary force to keep the system in check. And that inflation equals climate change. So, so, and I know that's a big deal and I know it's a big, but, but there is no way to solve, there is no way to solve 
climate change through a system that must grow forever on a finite planet and will and will debase currency to do it. There's some really big ideas to, uh, in, into this, and kind of why I was talking, why I was looking forward to talking to you, is is you're thoughtful on a whole bunch of okay, we understand the problem, and and as an entrepreneur, what I think about is once I understand the problem, all energy should go into what are the best possible solutions out of that, and 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 thinking about okay, what is a solution? Okay, so now take take that, and let's take. So UBI, um, essentially, to me, at least right now, it, it, on top of an existing system, what it does is, sa- is says, we're still in an inflationary world, but a whole bunch of people are hurting. We're going to make that go faster by printing more money to hold prices higher and higher and higher so that we get to decide who who dis- who uh, who gets what. I, I, I'm not sure that giving everyone a certain amount of money um, necessarily then says, and we're going to have everything get more expensive uh, because I agree with you. Ideally you would have innovations like solar that decrease the, uh, uh, that, you know, d- decrease the cost of a lot of things. Um, my ideal world of universal basic income is actually very minimalist where people are getting a certain amount of money. And I've seen this in real life where some people, if they get a passive income at a certain level, they just hang out in the woods. <laughs> yeah. So, so that by the way, that's actually the funny thing that we actually agree on. We agree that that technology f- saves our time, and we could do uh, do a, 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 we would uh, prices would fall, and and w- the world we're measuring is a completely arbitrary world because of printing money. That's where we agree with. And if you actually lowered your time preference and said what would actually happen. We can't measure that world right now because prices are going up. And when prices keep going up, no matter who makes them go up, and, and it, it, this is actually why it's not a political, I'm not on either side of the aisle or anything else. This is not a political statement. This is a statement for my kids that that we need a different system. Otherwise, I think our world burns. And it's not just a US phenomenon. This phenomenon you can see actually going all over the world. Yeah, yeah. The the big argument you make in the book, I believe there are a couple of big arguments you make. It's why I enjoyed it so much. Uh, but one is that we have to stop being addicted to inflation. We have to start allowing for deflation. But just so much of our system right now is predicated on prices going up a certain amount. That if you allow for deflation, and it is true that uh, if you had deflation, it would be seen as a massive policy failure right now. Um, and, 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 and so, so to carry that forward and now what, what potential, so if you had, there, there's about $120 trillion globally of negatively, negative real interest bonds. And so what ends up happening is, so, so that's a risk-free rate of all global trade and everything else. And it's not a the risk-free rate is negative. So if, it, if, if money is corrupted at the base layer, then you could expect corruption everywhere as a result. And that and and that's that's what's happening. So as a policy, how could you let's say let's say we agree, and and Andrew Yang is going to uh, try to be president next. But how could you say it's impossible to say, okay, we should go for deflation, because because what allowing deflation would do on a credit based system, is the assets would keep on un- unwinding, they would keep. Um, they'd keep and 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 the price and and because the real debt would explode and everybody holding the debt, which is largely government and corporations and everybody else and all the people on top, <laughs> would get. It, you might as well light light a fire because all of the prices would reset and the entire system would collapse and the government would be forced to come in and nationalize banks. And so now that's actually why this is a big deal because how do you transition from one system that that worked for a long time that we believe in, but doesn't work with where we're going in, as a species, as human, humanity. How do you transition between systems, and um, and 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 that? And so you need a transmission mechanism to allow that to happen. And that transmission mechanism that needs to be a global transmission mechanism. It can't be 
one government, one because because you couldn't do it as just the U.S. or Euro or Canada and anything else. It needs to be a global phenomenon. So you don't make this argument that explicitly in your book, though it, it is included. Is that it, it seemed like you're a huge Bitcoin and cryptocurrency uh, believer and proponent as a result, because you're looking at it saying, look, we have these currencies that are being uh, printed in various ways and, and governments are going to keep on succumbing to the, the, the incentives that they have. Um, so you need a new currency that they can't do that to. And let's call it Bitcoin. The supply is uh, capped. <laughs> you know, like, you know, if you wanted to, you couldn't make more. So, so Andrew, I, I've come to that conclusion and, and more as a result of research the book and everything else and, and essentially putting on my entrepreneur hat and, and going down every rabbit hole possible on what could, what is the best possible path to abundance for humanity. That's really what I, uh, what I, so, so yes, I become a big Bitcoin proponent, um, but I could care less about making money on Bitcoin. I could care less. Um, I, I care about the the world in which my children grow up in, and 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 and, and so I know that sounds and it, it's going to sound for a lot of your listeners like, oh, don't you just flip the tables on a system? Now these people have money and everything else, but the system. Remember, we can't measure what a system would look like from the system we're in, and so people aren't doing the work on what that system would look like. And, and that system would look like prices keep coming down lower and lower and lower forever. We believe that economics and we believe we need inflation. Everybody just unilaterally doesn't question why. So we believe our money must be worth less each year to live in a productive society. It makes no sense, but we believe it. And so it carries on. Um, uh, and, and, and this this allows that change from one system to another. And in if a whole bunch of people start engaging in it, and that if you saw uh, if you saw how fast that ecosystem is is evolving, then it, then it could provide prosperity for a whole bunch of people throughout that. And the system looks different in that. So what the system looks like in that is as labor is removed, prices fall. As labor is removed, prices fall, and it keeps on. So you can't control pricing by arbitrary changing units and pushing money into some people's pockets at the expense of others. So as labor, if we believe that technology is moving fa is faster and faster, which you and I do, and labor at some time is going to be coming out, we're not going to get net new jobs all over the, the, uh, uh, the world, then you must also, I, to me, advocate for a digitally native currency that allows defl for deflation. And, and because that won't come from government, because governments can't do it, because if they said we're all in on Bitcoin, the existing system would collapse. You need a transition mechanism to a new system that allows for abundance. So I understand all sides of the coin of, 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 of what this looks like, but, you, but, but it needs to be kind of a global system that allows this to, this to happen, and it's that big a deal. What proportion of cryptocurrency enthusiasts do you think come at it the same way that you do? Because a lot of them, and you just said, it's like, hey, look, I don't care about getting rich on this stuff. <laughs> like, I'm, <laughs> you know, but I, I think a lot of people are in the um, uh, in the crypto community in part because uh, they've realized so much uh, appreciation and wealth gains. So that's and, and and I think some of those people make other people wanting to learn what it looks like harder. It's why I do what I do, uh, kind of trying to come at it from first principles and really understand kind of where we are in in, in this. And I, I specifically don't say other cryptocurrencies because other cryptocurrencies, there's so much noise around them because, because they can be controlled. They look like a company. Uh, be, uh, so instead of Bitcoin, with it, which is truly at decentralized dis distributed why that's why that's important and uh, and really important is wealth doesn't mean anything on bitcoin you have no more power by having more wealth and what that means is if you tried to aggregate for control 
let's say you tried to control people through your Bitcoin. What that means by control, you'd be giving up your Bitcoin. You'd be lessening your control over time. So, so it works in an entirely different way than to, uh, today's world uh, looks. Once you have control, you <laughs> essentially political lobbying and everything else, and you aggregate more and more, more, more and more control. It looks very different than a system that uh, that that it, the way you actually add more Bitcoin in time is is providing more value to other people, and and. And what are, and you read this in the book, but we measure economics by scarcity by by value when it is in fact in scarcity. So the air you breathe, if it was valuable, then it should be the most expensive thing you um, in your world because it's your most valuable thing. And if we wanted to create jobs there, we could hire a whole bunch of people to bring us around air ma- oxygen masks. But the only I place did you- do that in the mountains once. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I was, I was, I was uh, in Colorado in the mountains and I did buy flavored oxygen at like a 7-Eleven and it was delicious. <laughs> <laughs> Where it's scarce. Where it's scarce. You buy, you, buy it, uh, you buy it on Everest and you buy it underwater. And it just kind of proves that point. And what's ending up happening is technology is making more and more things abundant. And, 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 and this is going to be hard for people that aren't following. Again, I'm at the leading edge of this in artificial intelligence and robotics. I see it. What's most what, people who listen to me agree that technology is going to come for us all. <laughs> it, yeah, exactly. And so, so, so that's that that piece. Then that then most things turn into oxygen. Yeah. Amen. Uh, you know, I mean that there there are a lot of entrenched interests that will fight it tooth and nail to your point, which is like, look, I've got a billion dollar franchise charging you lots of money for this stuff. (laughs) Totally. And, and why, and why system change rarely comes from the system. System change is imposed through technology uh, thing and trying to deliver more value to, to other people. If you just, if you just think about what Bitcoin is, and why it's growing on a network effect that fast and what's happening on that system. You could just look at, that's what it is. It's a system change. And why people don't see it is they're doing the same thing they did with the internet in 1996. They're projecting the current use of the internet forward instead of where it'll be. There are some themes I think that most people are sensing, um, which is that we have uh, a lot of change in the air, uh, we have a lot of institutions that are going to resist that change in part because they make a very handsome living <laughs> the, the current situation. Um, there are certain sub industries where uh, that will not work, where the, the old company will have to make way for the new. Uh, but there are a lot of industries where that's not happening, where you don't see that sort of replacement. Um, and I'm going to call out again education, healthcare, housing as like the, the three big examples. Another example you could throw in there is politics itself. Like you're not seeing a lot of uh, dynamism where you have an entrenched duopoly of two parties that have been. And you should know listening to this that there's nothing in the Constitution about two parties. This is actually a bit of a nightmare from <laughs> 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 uh, the perspective of. The founders, um, but it's it's hard to manufacture change, um, and so the big theme about how the system can't amend itself, and that change has to happen from outside the system, uh, I think makes perfect sense. And 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 because think about this from again, I, and I and I try to say this all the time: inside the system, there are really good people. Um, you. I would say a really good person trying to advocate for change. We disagree on the solution potentially. And I don't actually disagree that there doesn't need to be a social safety net on the way through on the other side. I would just like that social safety net not to be hidden from me in inflation pretending to say um, one thing because inflation is a hidden theft. So I would rather governments get elected on the truth on a new system and here's the taxes that need to go and we uh, and people vote for it rather than rather than um, being hidden from me but both both systems at their base whether it's republican or democrat require endless more printing so so then everything becomes on top of that system i believe in the free market it's not a free market 
it's not a free market. If so, we, like you just said, housing goes up and rent prices go up. It's it, it's it's not a free market when you're distorting that much money, corrupting that much money to make those housing prices go up. It's a function of the system. And so, so you need a new system because the system, I, unfortunately, can't change itself. So that, I think, was one of the big lessons from the price of tomorrow. Um, you're a very practical, constructive, uh, enterprising person. What would you recommend to people listening to this if they want to understand what's going on? I would say your book uh, is excellent and readable um, and might be someplace that, that, that they want to start. Um, and I, it, I can sense that you wrote this book really just because you wanted people to have a different lens of the world. Like it, 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 there, there was nothing to it. Other than I, don't, I, don't, I don't, I don't need to sell. I, I don't need to sell more books. I, I'm, I, <laughs> yeah, no, you're just trying to do good. I can yeah. sense it. Um, but one, one of the lessons I got was like, wow, I, you know, I should really be thinking about um, putting savings into things that can't just be inflated away <laughs> was one thing I thought, but like, like what, what do you recommend? So Andrew on, I would recommend, and I would never go say, go buy Bitcoin for, for everybody to, but I re- would recommend people definitely learn about it and why it's important and not just at the, at the, their natural response to say this uh, and, and push it away or those people are, self-promoting and everything else understand at a deeper level why it's important and then if you understand at a deeper level of why it's important get off zero and then uh, here's what makes me hopeful because your your next book and and what you're talking about american politics and global politics and 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 all of these things that are coming down the line from the existing system it's like reading signposts. And if you know wh- where this is going, you can read all of the tea leaves of what's coming next. And, and so what I would say in that is, is dig deeper. And then if you understand Bitcoin for what it could be, then, then earlier people on Bitcoin, just like if you invested in Amazon at $5, um, will do better. But actually, that's not so. So you have, you're self-interested in an earlier country advocating for bitcoin will do better than other countries and 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 um but but and and then if you understand the policy around it and what that means is essentially where we're moving with technology requires a a digitally native digital uh, uh, currency that allows for deflation every other policy concentrates wealth and privilege faster and concentrates all, all, all control. So if you understand what that is, then you'd look at the, the types of opportunities that could, could allow you to transition in that. And I see only Bitcoin being able to do, do that. I might be wrong. People need to say, okay, I might be wrong or everything else and do their own research, but that's the only thing that I see doing that. And so why I advocate for it is because, is because it's that important. You can also follow Jeff Booth. I've been following him and have been learning a lot. Thank you so much, Jeff. And we're going to keep working on this because your kids and my kids aren't going anywhere and we still have to try and keep this world from burning. (laughs) (laughs) Love that. Love that. 